The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the hosts and guests, and not necessarily those of the staff or management of Worldwide Digital Broadcasting Corporation. Knowledge is power, and this is powerful stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the Weekend Radio Team. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. Now, let's fire up the News Hour. Here is the Weekend Radio Team. Good afternoon and welcome to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. I'm your host, Michael McAuliffe, and with me is my co host, Perry Haichu. Welcome Happy to be here. Yep. <laughs> welcome to another edition. Boy, we are now five weeks away from the election. Yeah, that means very. we could be five weeks and one day away from sanity in, in cannabis policy in Nevada. And, and, and we're seeing uh, all of a sudden a lot of news is percolating up on this and we want to talk to you today about some of these so you can not only be educated voters out there but also so that you can uh, uh, persuade uh, friends and family members who might be sitting on the fence about this. So um, let's jump into it. Uh, the first thing that I, I noticed was a um, an article called The Burning Question, Should Nevada Legalize Recreational Marijuana Use? And it was in Vegas, Inc., which is a Greenspun publication. And um, you saw this article, yes. Perry. And, um, you know, it, it was there, and it was also available on the uh, Las Vegas Sun uh, website. And um, they're saying that, you know, uh, while Nevada already allows medical, uh, the the it is up to the populace now to vote on legalization uh, as as uh, viewers of this and followers of this uh, issue will know. Um, now, it's interesting, uh, they, in this article, uh, there's a fellow named Jim Hartman who's a Carson City attorney who helped uh, form the nonprofit coalition Nevadans for Responsible Drug Policy. Okay. Responsible drug policy. Mm -mm -mm, that doesn't sound good. Um, too many people, he says, are voting on a concept instead of what this ballot really says. And you know, you've got to give a little bit of credibility to that statement because the the ballot measure itself is 13 pages, and so uh, you're asking for a yes and no on a 13-page uh, article, and uh, so not everybody reads it. Uh, well, of course, they give you a. Uh when you get your sample ballots in the mail, they'll give you a summation and a pro mm -hmm. and a con and things like that. But of course, very, very few people, I would say, of course, less than 1% of the constituency probably reads the entirety of the uh Oh, absolutely, and it's not going to be there at the, at the election uh, in the election booth. Uh, Thirteen pages worth, I don't think. So, any, but you know, what he then says is because he's he's recently launched the No on Two campaign, and he says we're a grassroots effort to educate people on the dangers of doing that. No, no, we're the grassroots effort. He's not the grassroots effort. Well, you see, they try to flip the script on us now that we have the uh, the public. The uh, how, how, how would I put this? Now that the public is kind of in our corner mm -hmm. more so than against, I guess they try to paint themselves as the underdog in the fight now, and that they're kind of the little guy fighting big marijuana and big you know marijuana. they're and yeah they well they toss that around these days big marijuana when in realistic you know it, it's just nonsense. There is no big marijuana yet. We're working on becoming big marijuana, but you know I wouldn't say that we're quite there yet. No one's in the Fortune 500. You know they don't have mm -hmm. you know armies of lobbyists going to the you know going like to the, the pharmaceutical no of course do. not we, like i said we're working on it but uh well yeah. this nevadans for responsible drug policy is led by former assemblyman pat hickey who's in you know a cow county conservative here in nevada and a former assemblyman so even his uh supporters didn't uh uh didn't put him back into the did legislature. he turn out or did he get did he lose the primary um i don't I, really I'm know not, I, I, I'm not I don't, sure how that rolls. I'm going to have to look into that. And even if he turned out, he could have gone to the other house. Sure. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Right? But the So he's with the anti, uh, this anti-legalization group, and he argues that wholesale legalization would create state government bureaucracy and special interest monopolies while supporting mostly out-of-state corporate financial interests. That's would, not necessarily true. Would create true. state 
government bureaucracy. So it would. He's a he's a small, you know, small well, government sure. conservative. Well, and okay, all. you know, we had this discussion in 2013 when we were looking at either creating a new state entity to uh, take care of the new medical marijuana mm -hmm. dispensary program or to lop it in with a pre-existing state agency, and the idea was tossed around, but really it settled on giving it to a pre-existing agency to save money because we didn't want to be those guys that were going to try to raise taxes on a bill that's supposed to make money. Now, and that's that going to happen here too. Yeah, yeah, but it didn't really end up working out. The department of uh, behavioral, behavioral Health and Human Services has really done a piss poor job in my opinion of managing and trying to build the industry. Mm -hmm. In fact, in my opinion, they've done the exact opposite and done what they've could to suppress the industry and uh, I don't want to say fight against it, but you know, there's been example after example of the overly burdensome restrictions they put on to the time frame that they implemented these uh, these changes or these policies that were supposed to be enacted mm -hmm. from uh, the uh, number of uh, seminars that they hold to give doctoral and lawyer credits to uh, people when they're holding a seminar in op opposition to medical marijuana or yes. recreational marijuana that's funded by you know the same entity that they're supposed to be regulating it's kind of strange so when they say it's going to create government uh, burden on the government, yes, it will, but it'll pay for itself. Oh, absolutely. And uh, we have to have it because the departments that we put it in the hands of has proven themselves not incapable, but unwilling to cooperate with the industry. So why would we want them to continue the, upon this path? The, the most kindly view on that, I think, would be that they're treading cautiously in uncharted waters. But sure. it's not exactly uncharted because uh, medical marijuana has been around since 1995. There have been, uh, half the country now has it, and multiple states have, have uh, gone ahead with dispensaries over the past two decades and so there's plenty of uh, uh, pathfinding that's already sure. been done and just this. because the state decided to not implement any access to the medicine over the how many years when the right when the law was how many years was it when the medical marijuana law passed before they actually had dispensary? It was like 12, 13 well, years? Well, it passed like in that? 2000, so it was implemented okay. in 2001 and didn't get addressed by the legislature till 13. And then we didn't have dispensaries till what, 14, 15? Uh, until 15, You yeah. see, so, you know, that's their fault. It's hard for me to feel sorry mm -hmm. for that. You know, I can't really give that argument too much credit when they you know, did well, what they could to stop it. Also, so. that's the idea that um, this, this conservative uh, former assemblyman is saying, well, this is going to create more government bureaucracy as opposed to the government bureaucracy that you have from law enforcement going after uh, marijuana users hmm. that would not be doing this uh, if it were legal, uh, you're going to have your bureaucracy one way or the other on, on this issue. Well, okay, on that, there has been a uh, voice against question two within the medical cannabis community mm -hmm. stating that it's going to criminalize growing within 25 miles of a dispensary and for that reason alone we should toss the whole thing out mm -hmm. because it's bad and this and that but we were talking about this before and you said that well you know growing is already illegal so it's not yeah, really it, going to change it, yeah much. it's not going to change and that. if you're a medical marijuana patient it doesn't change your ability to grow because the sunset clause for them doesn't expire until 2018 which we will of course work hard to mm -hmm. squash completely in the next legislative session. Now, um, growing cannabis is just like doing anything else. It's really, the people who do it well make it look very easy. Mm -hmm. And uh, growing very, very top shelf medicinal quality cannabis and actually making it the like uh, in a price point that's reasonable compared to these massive grow operations that are going to be able to put forth a huge plethora of variety mm -hmm. and quality at the prices that we're just not going to be able to compete with in the not too distant future it's just not going to become reasonable to do home grows uh, unless you have very specific ailments that require very specific or you know, what i guess what i'm trying to say is in a roundabout way you're not going to get a whole new flood of people that are going to want to start doing this all of a sudden because it's legal uh mm -hmm. you know um the people who are already doing it are going to want to keep doing it i would think but for the for a normal guy it's just when you start adding up all the content all the time and all the expenses and all the risk it doesn't become worth it 
to grow your own weed. Just the reason why most people don't brew their own beer mm -hmm. or don't uh, make their own make whiskey yep. or whatever, just because the time whiskey and the is money. a little different in the way it's handled in, in the government. Uh, from right, wine uh, yeah, and, you're and not really beer. allowed to make that, are you? No, yeah, no, no you're not. Strange. But you can homebrew beer. You can you can make your own wine. And so, uh, if you have something that the the citizenry have voted to be legal, then why shouldn't you be able to produce it yourself? You should be able to produce it yourself, and that's one of the points of the bill. But what my point is is that you know that can be fixed and that should be fixed mm -hmm. but I don't believe that that in and of itself and alone is reason enough to throw away all of the potential good points of the bill and the steps that we could take on top of that bill and legislature so one of the one of the uh, I, I went on their re their website before the show and I, I'm not going to give it out because you can find it if you want to and I don't need to give them free press that way uh, is one of the one of the things that they're saying is you know, uh, looking at legalization in Colorado and they're saying uh, on their website that marijuana legalization is a bad idea according to Colorado Governor Hinkenlooper. That's what he and, said. Uh, and that's that's what he said back in 2012 yeah. when when uh, when it was up for election. But in in uh, the program. Program, the recreational program began in 2013 at the stroke of New Year's and since then Governor Hinkenlooper has changed his tune quoted this past May in a Los Angeles Times article he said the law is beginning to look like it might work and so is the the Denver mayor Michael Hancock who also opposed the law uh, and he told uh, Inc magazine last year that he's very proud of Colorado's marijuana industry and so uh, what I'm seeing is on on this um, anti website this no one question to uh, place um, I, I'm looking at lie after lie after lie and you know absolutely these people as fellow citizens have the right to disagree with us have the right to go out there and uh, try to plead their case before the voter yeah. and and make their best case uh, for why uh, something should go one way or the other but that does not give them the right to lie about it and and to put out all sorts of falsehoods we see that happening in the presidential election already and and it, it's just as wrong there as it is here there are no consequences. There is no entity that looks and does this fact checking and actually makes it makes it legit. It just is what it is. You know, everyone has the loosest slots in town, right? It's no big deal. It's just kind of generally accepted. Yeah. The same thing with this. You have to seek your own truth. If you really want to know what's going on, you have to take the information from both. There's three sides to every story, right? There's my side, there's your side, and the truth. So mm -hmm. you have to take both of those sides and find your own truth within that and uh, make the best decision that you think is, or make the decision that you believe is best for yourself and your community. And it's interesting you're talking about, you know, uh, the loosest slots and, and all because really uh, the slot industry uh, in the casino industry is uh, is all about percentages and so what what happens there is you go you go around town and you see 96 percent 98 percent 101 percent this and that and the same thing is happening in the polling for the marijuana legalization uh, initiative now according to this article from uh, Vegas Inc 53 percent of Nevadans support legalization according to a September 21st uh, KNTV uh, uh, Rasmussen poll. Uh, and so 53%, that's uh, well, as, Rasmussen, as of Rasmussen's kind of a traditionally more conservative they leading are. Uh, they, they absolutely polling. are. Yet at the same time, we see that um, uh, Suffolk University, which is based on Long Island, New York, uh, did a poll after the um, after the first uh, Clinton-Trump debate, mm -hmm. uh, which was hosted at Hofstra, which is out in Suffolk, Long Island, and uh, they they did a poll, which uh, they called up Nevada voters and they asked uh, who won the debate, and they also about the various issues. Now, according to them, and they're on the other end of the country, and is about as disinterested. Uh, uh, in the outcome of this, as anybody can be, uh, they polled Nevada households of likely voters, and they got 57% in favor, 33% opposed. So, huh. yeah, right, and so that's that's a, as of September 30th. So we have September 21st, 53%. September 30th. 57%. And then just today in the RJ, which is owned by arch prohibitionist Sheldon Adelson, uh, we have um, uh, an article entitled Nevada Pot ballot measure too close to call and according to the RJ and their polling data uh, there's 47 percent in favor 46 percent opposed and they mentioned the three and a half percent margin of error with about three or four times within the article to make it believe that that's so razor thin of a majority that's uh, 
If you, can, if you can believe them. Now, you've got two other polls which are uh, conducted by um, organizations who are uh, disinterested in this process. And you have uh, an organization which is owned by a prohibitionist who is saying, no, 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 no. Uh, that It's much closer than you think. And we see through the whole election season uh, – all election season that they try to make things into a horse race to keep things uh, to keep the public interested but in this case uh, I think what they're trying to do is tamp down the the public enthusiasm for this right. and the disgust with 40 plus years of failed drug war and they're they're going ahead and saying oh no no this isn't this isn't a sure thing a lot of people have questions about it and uh, it's, well, it's funny because they give true. these raise within margins proposed by the RJ but if you look when they mm -hmm. put this on their Facebook page, about 95 to 98 percent of the comments under the thread were in support of question two. So if it was really as razor thin as they said, wouldn't there be more of a a hearty discussion if it was that close? Well, the like problem, you see with the Trump and Cl when you see yeah. Trump and Clinton articles, mm -hmm. it's a banter back and forth. There's people going back. You know, it's a mm -hmm. very uh, energetic discussion between the two sides, and it's not this. It's energetic. They're so poking each other's eyes out. Yeah, but you. Don't, but you're right. You don't really see that here. It's so lopsided, and I would call what the court of public opinion on social media, at least, is in our quarter. If that means nothing else, well, we really sure hope that so. Means, but. Uh, We'll, see. we'll, well, see we'll talk come. more about it when we come back, uh, and we're going to take a quick break right now, so stay with us. Nevada Pure is a premier vertically integrated medical marijuana enterprise which offers top quality medical marijuana, great customer service, and a safe private environment. We carry a wide selection of medical cannabis strains. Our knowledgeable staff will insist you in finding the correct strain for your condition. Our trained professional staff can educate you on various strains for your condition, methods of consumption, responsible cannabis use, and the wellness benefits of cannabis. We aim to help patients achieve a better quality of life. Medical marijuana is a medicine, not an intoxicant. It's about a patient's well-being at Nevada Pure. From the moment you make an appointment with us, your care, health, and well-being is our priority. Nevada Pure is located at 4360 Boulder Highway, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out their entire menu at www.nevadapure.com. From the soothing sounds of a water wall to the warmth, wood interior, and beautiful artwork, as soon as you enter Sahara Wellness, you are welcomed into a relaxing space where we strive to provide our patients with a healthy balance of mind, body, and spirit. That balance is achieved through a compassionate and knowledgeable staff who possesses both a passion for the medical cannabis industry as well as unrivaled dedication to assisting those in need of a natural method of pain relief. Our bud tenders are available to assist patients in selecting cannabis-based medicine that best suits their needs from our selection of flour, waxes, CBD lotions, and delicious edibles. Sahara Wellness is located at 420 East Sahara Avenue, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out our entire menu at www.420sahara.com. And welcome back to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. We were just discussing before the break um, uh, numbers on, on polls and the fact that uh, the disinterested parties uh, seem to have a, a big um, uh, a big swing for the positive side, uh, the pro uh, question to vote. Um, and, you know, given that the, the RJ owned by Sheldon Adelson has come out and said that it's essentially a dead heat, um, you know, that brings to mind another race that he took a, a part in. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, in Florida, they had a medical marijuana initiative, and uh, Sheldon Adelson spent $5 million against it, from what I'm told, and um, it passed by a margin of 57% to 43%, uh, but it did not actually make it into Florida law because their uh, ballot initiative process required a passage rate of 60%. So he put this money so in. We and won, but we lost. And he, yeah, we won the majority, but but lost the vote anyway. And so uh, what I'm seeing here now from uh, Drug uh, War Chronicle for the DPA, um, Drug Policy Alliance, that is, uh, in Florida right now, uh, the medical marijuana initiative is cruising to victory in a new poll. This time, Sheldon is not putting his money, no, he put money in there. This time. Well, not not as much. No, not nearly you as know, much. Not nearly as much. And so what's happening now is that uh, according to the Florida Chamber of Commerce, uh, they've done a poll showing 73% of voters favoring their amendment to, which will create the medical marijuana oh, there program. Amendment two down there too, huh? Yes, and only 22% <laughs> opposed. So 72 to 73 to 22 means only 5% of voters are undecided at this point. And so they are going to cruise past on this one. 
on uh, at this point. And it shows that... Uh, that if you just let the people make up their minds on this issue without trying to skew them one way or the other, uh, that they're coming down on the side of sanity. Uh, uh, and we can only we can only hope so. It's just another domino to fall. It sure is. You know, I, uh, in this same piece that I got from DPA, uh, there's another poll showing that in Massachusetts, their legalization initiative is also favored. And that was a WBZ TV and University of Massachusetts. See, that one Amherst will surprise poll. me. If Massachusetts yeah. goes, well, they're winning 53 to 40 at this point. You we'll know? see. Oh, well, California's killing it. They're like, what, 70%? They're or something about like 70%. That. Like, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're going to get it. We're looking pretty good. Mm -hmm. uh, Massachusetts and Florida, you know, th those would be nice bonus victories for sure. Yep. I think Arizona's got yep. something on the... on the. Arizona has a legalization yeah. initiative as well. It's not doing nearly as well. We don't have recent poll numbers. Yeah. Also, there's uh, legalization uh, on the ballot in Maine. Maine. Yeah. And so uh, we have the opportunity to see up to three East Coast states, which would be a first for us in the nation uh, going for uh, cannabis legalization at this point. Um, we also see a, a, another point uh, from this, that the California Nurses Association has formally endorsed the Prop 64 in California, their legalization initiative. And uh, their statement read that California nurses believe strongly that the prohibition and criminalization of marijuana has ruined generations of lives, wasted hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars and failed to protect the public health and safety. Uh, Deborah Berger, the organization's president, uh, said this in a prepared statement and said that on balance, Prop 64 is, a, is significantly better for the public health and safety than the broken status quo, and we are pleased to endorse it. Hmm. I mean, uh, I trust nurses a lot. Nurses have taken good care of me for my whole life, and they, they are... They are a profession which is driven by uh, the desire to help because God knows they're not paid well enough. And so uh, I put a lot of faith in, in their common sense answers. And uh, so I am so happy they've come down on our side in this one. No doubt. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things that we see in uh, this whole issue is, oh, protect the kids got to save the kids oh my god the kids you know and one of the big issues that comes up and and uh the uh the no on two people uh, are saying that uh it's wrong for nevada kids because um uh well, they're saying that early marijuana use contributes to higher dropout rates and negative outcomes for kids without proving this in any way at all. But they're also saying that uh, part of the problem acting, well, is acting that as the though animals. that we want kids to get on, you know, that's the whole uh, bullshit argument is that that implies that we, in favor of legalization, want high school kids to be getting high, which is absolute which nonsense. We don't. I don't think high school kids should be getting stoned, just like I don't think they should be drinking alcohol in excess or smoking cigarettes. You know, it's just one of those things like I don't really understand how that burden falls to us that responsibility falls to us instead of the parents mm -hmm. to educate their kids on the pros and cons of these various substances and it's fascinating that the conservative small government people who are behind the prohibitionist side of this argument uh, are all about parental responsibility and and personal for responsibility certain, well, for certain guns, things sure but but not on this issue. Uh, you well, know, that's why you know, there are no political parties anymore. People say we need a third party. I say we need a second. You know, uh, people flip flop every time they want to when it suits their individual mm -hmm. needs. There are no purists anymore. And first of all, there shouldn't be party purists because that's ridiculous. But the people who do claim themselves to be very often are not. Like the Republicans, the fiscal conservatives recently passed the biggest tax increase in Nevada history. And, you know, no one cares. There are no repercussions. No, no right. one gives a shit. You know right. what I mean? Meanwhile, on the Democrat side, you know, I, I could point to tons of examples on either side. But like you said, on a on a social side, when you're talking about these uh, these conservatives, they don't act very conservative in some of these. Uh, well, I guess the repercussion it's, 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 came it's down it's to, to Michael Roberson, who was seen as one of the lead architects of that $1.4 billion tax increase. And um, he then ran for, in the primary for the CD3 seat, and he was beat beaten mm -hmm. by um, uh, Danny Tarkanian. Uh, and so, um, you know, there, there was a little bit of fallout, but generally very, very little. Um, you know, but the the prohibitionists are very big on saying that one of the one of the big downsides of legalization is that there are going to be a lot of edibles out there 
which there will be, yeah. and, and that they're going to be appealing to kids because they make gummy bears and they make peanut butter cups and they okay. make all sorts of different okay, things. Okay, well, first of all, they've already passed the laws in numerous states that state that you can't have like the fake Reese's with the orange labels mm -hmm. and they, you can't copycat Right. Established brand because names. That's essentially trademark Yeah, infringement. well, a couple of uh, edibles companies were sued for copyright infringement, mm -hmm. and so that stopped right there. So when you see these flyers with Kit Kat bars, there are going to be no cannabis Kit Kat bars because Nestle or who at Mars hasn't mm -hmm. authorized it, and that's the end of that right there. That's right. So let's get that out of the way. Now let's talk about the rest. I believe there's also a potential ban against the bright colorations, mm -hmm. and the, it has to be plain packaging. It right. has to be childproof packaging. It has and to that's be clearly what the Nevada labeled. Legislature will yeah, and it has year. to be completely, it has to be labeled uh, appropriately and all that kind of stuff. So to think that someone's just kind of magically stumble across this mm -hmm. and eat it is nonsense. And people, well, like, okay, if you were walking by and found an open piece of candy on the street, would you eat it? Of course you wouldn't because that's kind of gross. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, no, absolutely I wouldn't even, not. I wouldn't even take the five second rule on that if one. If people look and see a joint on the side of the street, a lot of stoners would pick that up and smoke it, but edibles are different because mm -hmm. food items are not socially accepted in that way for some reason. Mm -hmm. So when these people are like, oh, well, can your kids recognize the pot? It's like, well, even if they did recognize it and it was open, chances are they're not going to eat it because that's looked upon as kind of nasty. Even from a youth perspective, mm -hmm. I would never think of just eating something that I found off the ground. Yeah, if you found a ham sandwich on the ground, you're not going to no. pick it up and start No, or even if it. I found a package of gummy bears that was open. And of course, the other argument of that is, you know, edibles are quite expensive. The likelihood of someone misplacing those and just leaving them around for someone to find is very low. Unless they were really, really stoned. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's like, you know, I could make counterpoints to all that, but it's like a lot of the issues that they're bringing up have already been addressed in not only previous legislative sessions and the uh, level of regulation that's been put on the medical marijuana industry but they're mm -hmm. just going to roll it right over you know a lot of these things it's just blatant scare tactics and falsehoods the same old tactics that they've been using for decades and the thing is we don't have to reinvent the wheel on this other other states other legislatures other people are thinking about this issue and coming up with solutions in colorado for example uh, a requirement that edible marijuana uh, products come with a diamond shaped stamp and the letters thc uh, not just on the packaging but on the brownies or on the candies or other edibles themselves uh, took effect just this past Saturday uh, and this is reported uh, by the Associated Press and uh, Colorado's new universal symbol for foods that contain marijuana is designed to give the treats a distinct look even after they're out of the packaging in other words a pot cookie being passed around a high school cafeteria will no longer look so innocent giving parents a way to identify marijuana marijuana edibles without smelling or tasting them. So I don't see anything wrong with that. You no. Know? So that they're going to put a diamond on there, letters THC. You know, so if a, a teacher or a parent or somebody says, what you eating there? And they see half a diamond and a letter T, they're going to know what it is. Yeah. You know, yeah. Well, and, so you scarf it down. No, really of quick. course. But there you go. You know, that seems like a fairly common sense thing. You, I, I can't really think of a, a reason why we wouldn't, why we wouldn't put them on. The edibles. Is, I, it, it's a it's yeah. a common sense thing to do, and it's not really that it, it's that much of a problem. Now in Colorado, where we have legalization since 2013, um, the marijuana ingestion rate remains relatively rare for kids. Uh, the hospital, then they did a study of one single hospital uh, in the Aurora suburb of Denver, and the hospital reported uh, 81 children treated for accidental pot ingestion between 2009 and 2015. Uh, and authors noted that poor child supervision or product storage was present in about a third of these cases. Okay. So what did, this, this is kind of like the election voter fraud uh, hubbub that, that they're making. Uh, you can find very, very few cases of actual voter fraud. No one's going to go from this precinct to that precinct and try to vote twice, you know, uh, uh, and get themselves a felony potentially because it's just not worth the risk. So here we have something where they're making all these laws up uh, based on 81 kids over a six-year period, you know, and granted, this, this is, is just one hospital, but it's a small, small percentage 
of the total number of patients mm -hmm. that this hospital treats and the total number of kids in the state. And so uh, it's, it seems like this is just uh, uh, another um, straw man argument uh, that people are, are making to try and put impediments in the way of drug reform. Well, if, you know, their whole argument on the, the, the whole uh, no on two campaign is centered around, oh, you know, can your kids spot the edibles? It's like, yeah. well, what's your argument if they can spot the edibles? What do you have to say then? Yeah. You know, where yeah, do we exactly. go from there? And uh, as far as the no on two campaign, their website, um, you know, says, uh, you know, written and promoted by out of state big marijuana corporate donors. Well, for so are they. Well, the Faith and Freedom Coalition yeah. is sponsoring their walkers that are going around and handing out door to door. Mm -hmm. So when they say out of state interests are involved, they are out of state interests being sponsored by big super PACs that are sponsoring the ground game to do this. So I don't really understand where they're coming from with that. And that's. And, you know. <laughs> well, without a doubt, Marijuana Policy Project that's uh, been around for some years uh, is responsible for a number of uh, marijuana initiatives in the country this year and in the past several cycles. Um, but they're a nonprofit organization. They're not doing it for personal profit. They're doing it because they think it's the right thing to do. And since we can't get federal action on this, we have to do it on a state by state. Yep, no basis. choice. You know, they, their website uh, also says it becomes a crime uh, for home cultivation of marijuana within 25 miles of a retail shop. And that's just a lie. It's a flat out lie. It becomes a crime as if it is not already. <laughs> You know, it's as I said a little earlier, these guys have the right to try and sway the voters to their side, but not to lie to voters and, and not to do it by deception. Uh, they're saying special interest monopolies to liquor wholesalers and current medical marijuana licensees. You know, that's, that's a qualified truth because what they're doing is they're giving an 18-month window to the um, uh, medical marijuana licensees uh, uh, to kind of recoup their investment before opening it up to well, to you know, more. it's like I've told you time and again, Mike. I don't, uh, I don't like a hundred percent of the, I don't, I don't like a hundred percent of the wording in this bill. I don't mm -hmm. like a lot of things. I don't mm -hmm. like the, uh, the no growing clause. I don't like. I don't like that exclusivity, that distribution ship clause. Mm -hmm. I don't like a lot of things in the bill, but once again, you, we have to take these positive steps, these positive steps forward if we're going to attempt to amend them later. How's the legislature going to react if we're attempting to put a bill draft forth and they say, well, the, the people don't even want it. How do you expect us to take it up if the constituents don't even want it? You know, and they can kick it back and forth all they want. So we need this in order to continue to win these battles and going forward. I absolutely agree. So I'll t we're going to take another quick commercial break now, and then we're going to come back with our guests this afternoon. Stick with us. From the soothing sounds of a water wall to the warmth, wood interior, and beautiful artwork, as soon as you enter Sahara Wellness, you are welcomed into a relaxing space where we strive to provide our patients with a healthy balance of mind, body, and spirit. That balance is achieved through a compassionate and knowledgeable staff who possesses both a passion for the medical cannabis industry as well as unrivaled dedication to assisting those in need of a natural method of pain relief. Our bud tenders are available to assist patients in selecting cannabis-based medicine that best suits their needs from our selection of flowers waxes, CBD lotions, and delicious edibles. Sahara Wellness is located at 420 East Sahara Avenue, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out our entire menu at www.420sahara.com. Hi, I'm Armin Yemenijan, CEO of Essence Dispensaries, and I'd like to let you know a little bit about our company. As a completely complimentary service, our on-site nurse is here to meet with any patient or non-patient to discuss dosing and best practices. We have three convenient locations. We have one location on Tropicana between Decatur and Jones, which is our west side location. Our Henderson location is on the corner of Sunset and Green Valley Parkway, and we're proud to announce that we have the first and only dispensary on the Las Vegas Strip, on the corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Sahara. Our prices are the lowest prices in town and the highest quality medicine. Please come and see us at one of our three convenient locations or visit us at EssenceVegas.com. You can also call us at 702-978-7575. Once again, the number is 702-978-7575. Attention medical marijuana patients. Do you know what your cannabis actually contains? Are there heavy metals, pesticides, or even more? And what strength is it really? And is it really what you need? 
Well, the answers to these questions are simple. DigiPath Labs. DigiPath Labs is a Nevada state-approved medical marijuana testing facility whose scientists carefully test products for safety and potency, all within the state's rigorous mandate. You can buy with confidence and trust knowing DigiPath Labs has tested your medicine. If you're a licensed grower, dispenser, extractor, or edibles manufacturer in Nevada and want unparalleled customer service and consumer confidence, go to digipathlabs.com and find out what we can do for you. And as a patient, only go to dispensaries that carry the DigiPath Labs seal of approval. That's digipathlabs.com, D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. Or call us at 702-209-2429. That's 702-209-2429. And welcome back to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Uh, on the phone, uh, we have today uh, one of my favorite people in the whole world, the CEO of Pistol and Stigma up in uh, the Carson City area, Rebecca Gasca, and also uh, Eva uh, Losi Grossman, uh, who is the leader of the Weekend 775 uh, nonprofit uh, up in the northern part of the state. Welcome, ladies. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Good to be with you. I, it's so exciting. And to hear your voice. It's, it's How are you? Always a pleasure. Very, um, very well. Thank you for spending your time with us this afternoon. Absolutely. Oh, very too. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. Uh, 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 Rebecca and I have known each other for a number of years since she was with the ACLU, and we were uh, uh, working on legislation together. And then you met her separately uh, in the 2013 session, uh, Perry. Yes, and I, was, uh, I was fortunate enough to have the stars align during a certain trip up there. Absolutely. And, and, so, and so now you're working, uh, the two of you are working together. So, so tell us, what's going up on in the northern part of the state with you guys? Uh, let's start uh, actually first with uh, Eva and see how Weekend 775 is doing. Well, uh, we've just kind of started getting things rolling here, um, and we have uh, every other, uh, sorry, second Tuesdays is when we have our, our meeting, which is a... Uh, been uh, growing and we've got a board put, put together uh, we've had um, some fun you know just kind of social gatherings uh, informing people letting them know what it's about we just had a booth recently at an event uh, where we handed out uh, lots of information letting people really know what we can is um, all the dispensaries cultivators uh, manufacturing people are are in they're like yes we want to be part of this uh, and patients are excited about it. So we've got a really good buzz going, and we're hoping to have um, our first event to be a Halloween event. And followed uh, also uh, Thanksgiving. We're going to have a Thanksgiving potluck for any of the um, wayward uh, Easterners <laughs> like myself <laughs> or from anywhere, not just Eastern, but anyone who doesn't have uh, something to do on Thanksgiving, we're, we're hoping to make that a potluck extravaganza. Outstanding. So um, it, it's great to hear that uh, another weekend chapter has started, and it sounds like you're uh, you're doing uh, very good things up there. So um, what are you what are you planning on doing um, in in this election cycle? Are you getting uh, voters registered at all? Are you doing any public awareness work I'm there? I'm glad that you asked that question um, because uh, at, at the dispensary in Reno um, uh, and I. Uh, Kayana dispensaries as well. So the dispensary is just called the dispensary, and that's actually where my husband Jeff uh, Grossman works. Um, he is uh, working there now, uh, and Kayana, uh, they're doing, they're having a voter registration, uh, and I will get to. I'm going to be posting the times on Facebook uh, so people can see when that's happening. But they're going to do that at at the dispensaries. Outstanding. So, Rebecca, let's turn to you now. How, how are things going at Pistol and Stigma? Things are great. Things are really exciting. Um, obviously, we're excited to be working with Eva, and I just have to say I'm so thankful that the group up here in the north has extended all of your guys' goodwill from the south and up into the north to have a presence with WeCan up here. I mean... Yeah, Michael, you and I met, I think it probably was seven or eight years ago. And then Perry, thank God for you, back in the 2013 session, like, I wouldn't even be doing what I'm doing were it not for the two of you. So, um, 
you guys never get enough accolades and appreciation. And I know that for my dying day, I will forever be thankful for everything that you guys have given to this industry, even for the people who don't even know that you were the kind faces behind it all of the time. Um, well, thank you. Thank you. Well, those, those yeah. are very kind and generous <laughs> words, but, but I know that, that you, Rebecca, a queen of Burning Man, uh, can, can accomplish just whatever you set your mind to. So, it, uh, you know, wh whether, whether we may have helped you a little or a lot, uh, you would have been in, going in these directions anyway. Um, no doubt. Uh, I, uh, there's also much, much more work to be done. Hopefully, we'll be able to, uh, what do they call that, uh, cross-pollinate some ideas <laughs> next legislative session. That's what we do. That's what we do. We cross-pollinate. <laughs> and that's just what I was going to ask you, Rebecca. What, what, are, what do you think is going to be uh, uh, happening in the next legislative session, uh, uh, presuming, of course, that this initiative passes? Well, yeah, I mean, and it's anybody's toss up here, right? Right now, um, there. Uh, I've actually, I've actually kind of stayed out of the Nevada game um, here in the last um, year or so. Really, last legislative session was a pretty unique one. Um, most of Pistol and Stigma's work is actually happening in other states. Right now we're working with clients in Pennsylvania to go through the application process there. Earlier this year we supported clients through the Hawaii's application process and they were awarded their license which oh, is wow. really exciting because that was a very very competitive market outstanding so well, it, it would be difficult same. for you to um to make a living off the nevada legislature given that it only meets uh for a third of the year every other year so you know <laughs> right. it forces you to yeah, kind of it's branch out. impossible and you know me like i hate politics and so i don't i don't which I don't is why you have a lobbying sort of the, <laughs> yeah. The, so, the political interim, like I'm not a, I'm not a joiner really. I don't really care for um, party politics. I'm, I'm, I tend to be a post-partisan person. But this next legislative session will certainly be an interesting one, regardless of whether or not question two passes. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the industry right now um, has finally started to get its foothold. We'll figure out what the department is going to think in terms of its own longevity and ability to be responsive to um, companies and patients. Um, and, you know, if question two does pass, the department is going to be forced to work with the, depart the Department of Health, of course, that oversees um, the program here in Nevada is going to be forced to work with the Department of Taxation so that they can hopefully streamline a process that moderately mirrors what the Department of Health has put together um, because under question two, of course, it's the Department of Taxation that's going to oversee everything. And I think all business owners are going to be interested in a, um, a streamlined sort of approach because we all know that, you know, regulation is great when you're trying to get out of the black market, but over-regulation can be overbearing. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to really be up to the department to work together with the constituencies that matter, the stakeholders in the industry, to make sure that over-regulation isn't the norm. And over-regulation... Uh, Overregulation yeah. results in um, in things like uh, this uh, this legislation being passed in 2013 and no dispensary opening in the state for two years after that. So um, <laughs> you know we definitely don't want to go in that direction. What I am hearing though is that uh, if the initiative passes, that the legislature is going to take a um, a page out of the Colorado uh, statutes and essentially uh, turn uh, a streamlined process in April where the current MME uh, medical marijuana establishment license holders uh, will be able to start selling in a short period of time while the under the auspices of Department of Health uh, while the Department of Taxation is working on its overall policies uh, for the for everybody else that's that's actually pretty, um, interesting to hear and hard for me to believe um, constitutionally speaking 
the legislature is actually prohibited from um, addressing any ballot initiative or creating any sort of frameworks as a result for three years after an initiative passes. And so I, I don't know how technically they could do that. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's a workaround. I mean, I'm not an attorney. The people at LCB are way, the Legislative Council Bureau are way smarter than me. But, I mean, this was a serious set of case law that um, was responsive to the Nevada Clean and Door Act, the, the tobacco-related um, ballot initiatives from last decade. I think it was, or maybe it was earlier this decade. Um, uh, but I, 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 technically speaking, I'm under the impression that the legislature can't actually do anything about this ballot initiative you mean make years. substantive changes to the uh, to the wording of the initiative what constitutes well, substantive change then? yes that's that's definitely clear but even still it's like if it passes they can't they definitely can't make any changes maybe that's maybe that's the loophole then that they can do something to help um, like foster it I suppose so I guess maybe that would be the workaround. Mm -hmm. That I mean, that would be fascinating and interesting, and it'd be interesting to see if there isn't a challenge to it. Um, again, I'm not an attorney. There are way smarter people than me working on this issue, but... I don't well, know. You're pretty sharp. Hey, will you girls stick around for uh, just a, a couple more minutes? We're going to take a quick commercial break and be right back with you. Absolutely. Thank you so yeah. much. And we hope everybody else will stick around, too. See you in a minute. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Armin Yemenijin, CEO of Essence Dispensaries, and I'd like to let you know a little bit about our company. As a completely complimentary service, our on-site nurse is here to meet with any patient or non-patient to discuss dosing and best practices. We have three convenient locations. We have one location on Tropicana between Decatur and Jones, which is our west side location. Our Henderson location is on the corner of Sunset and Green Valley Parkway, and we're proud to announce that we have the first and only dispensary on the Las Vegas Strip, on the corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Sahara. Our prices are the lowest prices in town and the highest quality medicine. Please come and see us at one of our three convenient locations or visit us at EssenceVegas.com. You can also call us at 702-978-7575. Once again, the number is 702-978-7575. From the soothing sounds of a water wall to the warmth, wood interior, and beautiful artwork, as soon as you enter Sahara Wellness, you are welcomed into a relaxing space where we strive to provide our patients with a healthy balance of mind, body, and spirit. That balance is achieved through a compassionate and knowledgeable staff who possesses both a passion for the medical cannabis industry as well as unrivaled dedication to assisting those in need of a natural method of pain relief. Our bud tenders are available to assist patients in selecting cannabis-based medicine that best suits their needs from our selection of flour, waxes, CBD lotions, and delicious edibles. Sahara Wellness is located at 420 East Sahara Avenue, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out our entire menu at www.420sahara.com. Yeah. And welcome back to the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour, where we are um, speaking with Rebecca Gasca and Eva Losi Grossman uh, from Upstate. Hey, so let me let me ask you, uh, Rebecca. We had uh, you had just talked about you know how razor thin this uh, uh, this initiative is right now, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on that because I, I've got in front of me three different polls. One from uh, KNTV down here in Rasmussen uh, as of September 21st showing a 53 percent uh, in favor of uh passage then uh, Suffolk University after the Clinton the first Clinton Trump debate uh, polled Nevada voters uh, on who won the debate but also on the um, uh, on question two and uh, they show it uh, passing by 57 to 33 percent and then just this morning we had the uh, the RJ obviously owned by arch prohibitionist uh, Sheldon Adelson come out uh, with their own survey showing it at 46 47 which is obviously razor thin so where where would you um where would you put your poker chips uh uh in in this pool uh do you uh do you put a lot of faith in in the rj's poll uh, as compo compared to uh uh these out-of-state people you know i i'm so torn on this this ballot question and i should probably make it clear that i'm not and my company's not um 
taking a stance on it. We've worked with so many people through the medical process, licensing process in Nevada, and have given our general thoughts about the pros and cons of this uh, this um, initiative question that we're just letting our clients really be the leaders in terms of how they see most fit. I think that the polls that have been conducted, um, <clears throat> the, the, the more the 50%, the 56 7 is probably more reflective of actual reality. I mean, you know, the initiative, the adult use initiative that was run here um, several years ago by MPP that failed, barely, barely failed at that point. And since then, we've seen that, you know, this guy hasn't fallen in Colorado. And I think voters are much, you know, more um, astute even than they were then. And, I mean, it just evidence shows that really adults can use cannabis <laughs> however they see fit, you know, in their personal lives. Um I think Without that the, the RJ falling, poll yes. is right. definitely skewed. We know um, what the motivation is behind that, and it's really, it's really too bad because we're seeing increasing evidence that shows that um, marijuana is actually an exit drug, mm -hmm. right? And we know that Sheldon Adelson's wife, Dr. Miriam Adelson, runs methadone clinics, and actually, cannabis is probably one of the best drugs possible to get people off of other um, of pharmaceutical or, yeah. or heavy street drugs. You know, cannabis is actually saving lives, and it's really too bad that they don't wake up and see this. Um, but I, I, I really believe that that 47% number is probably incorrect. incorrect. Do I think that it's a very close race? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that if people care about the decriminalization of marijuana and really want to see a shift in Nevada policy, they should vote for it. Um, I think that, you know, if people are against it, they need to really ask the questions of why. Like, I think that the campaign against it is just being built on total fear, um, which is unfortunate. But I Pat Hickey actually told me that he was uh, pro medical, and I sure uh, you know I've had the fortune of getting to be in a couple panels and listening to the debate back and forth. And I think the temperature here among patients and uh, and non patients that I have talked to is um, a little bit hesitant because. They, everyone loves loves medical, and they all support medical. Um, Especially when the then, voters support it by over 80% majority. Right. Yes, yeah. absolutely. And then it, it's kind of comical to me that because they're, in my opinion, that I, these are only my opinions and, you know, don't reflect the views of anyone that I work for, but they're, they're one and the same. Um, and, you know, there isn't a, really a difference. Um, it's just that a lot of people are... Uh, maybe self-medicating, um, you know, any, and and uh, recreation is medical. Um, you know, what's the number one thing that we need to do in this country? We need to, you know, stop working so much to uh, relax. Everyone's stressed out. Um, you know, recreation is a medical need. Uh, and there, of course, it's a preventative medication, and, and, and you know, everyone has an endocannabinoid system. And uh, it, it, it's required, you know, not required, but it's something that your body needs. So if your endocannabinoid system is out of whack a little bit, um, you know, you shouldn't, um, you shouldn't have to go to so much trouble Absolutely. <laughs> to be able to, to fix it. So, Ava, uh, we've got just about a minute left or so, and we know that uh, you're getting ready to do your own radio show because it's not only Weekend 702 down here, but Weekend 775 up there has a radio show. Uh, and can you tell us about it in a, in a minute or so and, and where to look? Sure. Um, my show is called Everyday Cannabis with Eva Sativa, um, which is actually brought to you by... Uh, uh, Pistol and Stigma and Green Light Drafts, and and uh, it is on uh, Voice America Radio, which is Voice America 
dot com the live show which is airing every Tuesday from four to five PM and then all archive shows can be seen there or you can uh, pretty much catch them as a podcast any place where you could find a podcast. Um, so you know, Google Play, Kindle, uh, iTunes, everywhere. And uh, you can contact me at Eva uh, Sativa at everydaycannabisradio.com um, if you have any questions or for information. And please follow us uh, on Facebook. Um, our URL, I'm sorry, our handle uh, is Eva Sativa seven seven five for Twitter and for uh, Instagram as well. So check it out. It's a fun show, and we've had great guests all the time, and maybe you'll come be one. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm just thrilled that, that we're building, like, network coverage here almost, that we're able to hand off <laughs> one cannabis show to another cannabis show. It's really exciting where we're coming. And, and Rebecca, should should anybody be listening who, who might be in the industry who's, who's looking for, you know, an absolutely outstanding hotshot lobbyist, how do, how do people find you? Oh, they can also just come on to our website, pistolandstigma.com. They can also find us through greenlightdraft.com. That's the subsidiary of Pistol and Stigma that provides policies, plans, and procedures for cannabis operators. We're really excited about that um, side of the work that we do and helping, um, helping operators really ground into scalable work. So um, info at greenlightdraft.com or info at pistolandstigma.com. And that's pistol um, and stigma is the and an ampersand or spelling out the word and? Good question. P-I-S-T-I-L, mm-hmm. like the, yes. you know, the botany term, pistol, and A-N-D, stigma.com. Great. So definitely spelling it out. Okay. Well, and ladies, we're, we're, make we're sure about to tell our listeners to tune into your show before <laughs> before ours. One hand washes the other, uh-huh. and one pa- hand passes the joint to the other. So uh, <laughs> it's our turn to pass it over to you, ladies. Uh, so we're going to have to get off the air and do a couple of commercials so we can do that. And and thank you very much, Rebecca Gasca of Pistol and Stigma, uh, Ava Losi Grossman of uh, We Can Seven Seven Five. Perry Haichu of Weekend 702, and for myself, Michael McAuliffe, thanks for listening in, and tune in to us again next week, and we will bring you the very latest on the cannabis campaign in Nevada.